Hi, my name is Randy Kapralik. I'm a member of the Philly Pops, and I'm happy to be here on behalf of All City Jazz. I'm going to be discussing some elements of being a section player in a big band and some of the things that that entails. Um, so being a section player, you could be the lead trombone player, you could be playing second, third, or fourth, and uh, you could also be the bass trombone player. And that has different connotations for where you're sitting in the section. Uh, of course, if you're playing lead trombone, one of your primary objectives is to listen to the lead trumpet player. Um, we're always told, listen to the lead player. But what does that really mean? So if I'm listening to the lead trumpet player on a passage in a big band chart, there's a lot of elements that I'm trying to pick up on between what he or she is doing. Um, inflection, intonation, articulation, um, dynamics um, are all part of what goes into this, uh, as, as well as rhythmic feel, which can vary from lead player to lead player. If you're playing one of the under parts in the trombone section, you have to listen to that lead player and but within that there's also uh some some room for differences in, in how you're listening so if you're playing fourth trombone yes you need to listen to your lead player but let's say you have a low f and the bass trombone player has a pedal b flat the lead trombone might be all the way up here on a high a and it's important to listen to your lead player but that open fifth at the bottom there means you really have to listen pretty hard to the bass trombone player to make sure you lock in that interval and get it as in tune as you possibly can. So listening doesn't always mean just listening up to the lead player. Um, a lot of times it depends where you are in the chord. And that's something that happens often between a fourth bone and a bass, drum, uh, bass trombone or third trombone and bass trombone. There's big open intervals. Uh, that happen lower in the piano. And I'm going to go over some things later, some ways that you can practice uh, hearing that and getting that in tune a little bit better. Um, a few other things you need to listen for are, um, is it unison? Is it unison between the whole horn section? Or is it unison just in the trombone section? Or can I hear a trumpet player behind me who's in unison with me? Uh, or possibly an octave above me that I can really hone in on as well as listen to the lead player? Um, your cutoffs, your inflections, everything has to be filtered through uh, the lead trumpet player if you're the lead trombone player, and then the lead trombone player if you're playing second, third, fourth, or bass trombone. Um, if you're the lead trombone player, if no other sections are playing with you, that's when you can really let your inflections fly, and you can do scoops. Uh, you can play around with your cutoffs, uh, whether they be really sharp or if you're releasing them kind of softly. That's where you can let a, a lot of personality shine through. But if you have other sections, the trumpets or the saxes with you, you have to temper that. Um, and you can't go sticking out. You can't go rogue at that point. Um, I always like to tell uh, one story that's um, a little bit incriminating uh, about myself. But um, in playing with Terrell Stafford's uh, Philly Pops Jazz Orchestra of Philadelphia one time, uh, we were rehearsing. I can't remember what chart we were rehearsing, but I remember this story very well. Um, at one point, Terrell cut off the band and, and gently said to me, he said, Randy, you're playing louder than Nick, Nick Marchione, the lead trumpet player. And that was all he needed to say. And I feel like that probably never happened again because by him saying, I was playing a little bit louder than Nick as a lead player. I really took that to heart because that meant I wasn't listening to Nick hard enough um, to get my volume in check. And if you are, are a real contributing section player, no matter what part you're playing, you'll be very careful not to disrupt that hierarchy of listening that needs to happen. And that was the only time Terrell ever needed to say that to me. And I bet if you asked him that any time after that, uh, he probably would never have said that I was playing louder than Nick for an extended period of time. Maybe on the sight read of a chart, I might have come in on an entrance. I might have uh, not guessed exactly where Nick is going to be and had to tone it down right away, um, which uh, happens all the time in rehearsals. But for Terrell to actually mention it to me, mean I needed to recalibrate 
uh, how I was hearing things. So being a section player is selfless. Um, and it can be really, really, really satisfying, especially if everybody in the section treats it uh, like a really important job and opens up your ears and listens. So a big part of being a good ensemble player is being able to execute what's on the page. Um, and I think that, like a lot of things, involves two things. It involves the creative and the technical. Creatively, you have to be able to listen and absorb what's going on around you so that you can react to it. Um, technically, on the trombone specifically, it means we have to be able to articulate in specific ways and play in certain ranges of our horn and certain volumes. And that takes daily practice. Even if you only have a little bit of time per day to do it, I always tell brass players it's better to do a little bit every day rather than, let's say, an hour one day and then skip three days. Uh, you're developing your embouchures at this point, and the more consistently you can play your trombone day to day, the more muscle memory that you have and the better your embouchure will work for you. So I do long tones. They're not everybody's favorite, but I'm going to show you a couple different ways you can do them to make them... Um, a little bit more engaging. So there are days when I just do long tones with no accompaniment. And just to show you a couple of them. down the horn descending chromatically so I hit every note there's also the style of long tone where you always return back to first position so you would do F E F E flat F D all the way down to B natural and that's one partial F to B is called a partial on the trombone then I would go lower and I would start on B flat do that sequence all the way down to low E and then I would jump up and do them higher and higher on the horn um, they're really great for developing your sound. You hear so many people complain that they don't like their sound. I, I practice all the time, but I, I don't like my tone. Well, long tones, you're just focusing on your sound. Um, and also your, your attack, whether you're actually um, articulating the note or if you're using breath attacks, which is a good idea to do also. Um, but there's nothing else going on. You're not playing in time. You're not tonguing a crazy exercise or doing slurs, you're just listening to your sound. And that can be so beneficial to do that a little bit every day. But if I want to incorporate um, some listening along with this of other instruments, um, if you have a keyboard uh, with a sustain pedal or a piano, um, I like to hit different shapes low in the piano when I'm doing my long tone. So let's say I'm playing that F I'm just going to hit a B flat and an F in my left hand. It's this open fifth here. And now what I'm doing is I'm essentially practicing playing an F as it's the perfect fifth in a B flat chord. It could be B flat major, dominant, minor, we don't know, but I'm getting used to hearing that octave. Then if I go to my E, I'll do the same thing. I'll play an A and E in my left hand, just down a half step. I'm really listening and letting all those waves that can happen in the note when you're trying to get it in tune. I'm trying to level them out so they, they come to a stop. Um, th this is really rehearsing um, playing in tune just like you would be working on a muscle group if you were uh, curling or lifting weights of some sort. Um, your body will react to this and you'll get better and better at it all the time. You just have to do it consistently. As I move up the horn, I'll skip. I won't do all those in the F partial, but as I move up in the horn, sometimes I get a little bit more experimental with the chords that I'm playing. So rather than just playing the root or a fifth, let me play, I'm gonna play a concert B flat, but instead of just playing it along with that, I'm gonna play a B triad or a C flat triad underneath. 
So now what I just played, um, if you're thinking A sharp, you could think I just played a B major seven. If you're thinking B flat, theoretically that's a C flat major seven. Um, technically it, it doesn't really matter as much for the moment what you call it. It's the sound that matters. I'm getting used to playing the sound against a B in the bass, which is not the easiest thing to do when you first try it. But it's so good for your ears. We're working on ear training and we're working on theory while we're working on our sound and doing long tones. Um, to take it a step further, I will cheat on my long tone sometimes and not just hold out one note, but I'll start improvising on a sound. So let's say I'm working on a, a D above my tuning note and I'm going to play a G and a D in the left hand to have that open fifth. did there was I played in G for a minute, I played a G triad, and then I slipped into an, an A triad sound over G. Now I know I might be pushing the limits as far as uh, some people's theory knowledge, um, but I learned all of my theory just by messing around on the piano before I had any classes on it. So if you can not worry about what things are called so much, but just try to make sound and then go, well that sounded kind of neat, I played an A triad with a G in my left hand, that's neat. Later on, you can learn like, okay, that means Lydian, or that's implying an A triad over a G. Um, to continue on that topic, let's say I'm playing an E flat. This time I'll play a minor sound. I'll play E flat and B flat in my left. <laughs> natural minor, which is also the G flat major scale. Um, I can also try, for anybody that knows Dorian, I can try that same thing but with a C natural instead of a C flat. <laughs> am I working on my ear training but I'm also working on improvising and I'm still kind of just messing around um, I'm not playing in time I'm not thinking of a chord progression I might be thinking of a particular chord um, but learning to play these little fragments can really increase your uh, comfort level when all of a sudden you have some changes put in front of you um, now, the, it takes a lot of work to be able to then play chord progressions after that, but this is a start, and I often feel that students try to jump too quickly into playing the chord progressions that are on a blues or on a standard, um, if they haven't spent any time just figuring out what to play over one chord. Um, and one final thing, I, I do scales every once in a while with this, and they don't even have to be full scales, they could be let's say one, two, three, four, five scale degrees in a major key. So if I do C, all right, that's not too bad because there's no flats or sharps, but some of the keys, it can be a little bit more elusive. Let's say D flat. minor keys if I do D flat minor. So this also helps me work on keys that I might not be as familiar with at this point or keys that I don't play every day but this way I actually ensure that I go through all these keys in some way and sometimes 
I'll play a phrase. If I've learned a phrase that I really like in one key. <laughs> Played it up a half step in the key of A, trying to remember what I played the first time. Um, but this is a way you can start to 12 key things, and they can be really simple. They don't even have to be as many notes as that. They could be a triad that you play through half steps. The bottom line is, and this is also something I, I tell my students, you're not going to get better on your big band charts by just practicing your big band charts. Actually, the more efficient way to do it is by finding some of these uh, practice techniques and doing them regularly. Because you will plateau if you practice your part to uh, freckle face every single day. You will get to a point where you're not growing anymore. But if you're working on playing major sevenths um, over a major triad, or you're working on playing your dominant seven over a major triad, um, that will help you hear more. So when we say listen to the lead player, that means more to you than just listening to that player. It gives you more of an idea of, of how you can actually react and adapt to the sounds around you. So I'm gonna talk about the great Sammy Nestico chart, Freckle Face, a little bit. And if you ever have the opportunity to play this in a big band, the first thing I think you should do is listen to as many recordings of it you can find. There um, are originals off Count Basie's albums, um, and there are a ton of live recordings that you can find on YouTube, which are just so much fun to watch. Um, the big thing is they're at different tempos, and this chart can mean many different things at different tempos. Um, so I would listen, and I would also try to wrap your ears around the melody a little bit. Um, you can transcribe it by ear. You can see if you can find some lead sheets. I like doing a combination of both just to kind of double check uh, the melody. I also like to write down the chords too, and I can double check against any lead sheets I find. And the other thing is the, the chart on this is really wonderful too. So you can check the chords right, right on the chart. Um, I'm gonna play just a little bit of the melody of it, just so you can kind of get it in your ear. sections I kind of was using my own inflections it's not really how it goes so much in the big band chart as far as articulations um, but I like to just hear it as a melody first um, and then kind of look at the chord changes uh, to understand what's going on um, just to dissect a tiny bit of it uh, when it starts the the lead in the pickup measure goes to a C minor chord so melody note I'm playing here is a G, which is the fifth of C minor. That goes to F7, then it goes to D minor, and that's in the solo changes. I think in the head of the chart, it actually goes to a B flat chord. So B flat major seven, D minor, they can be interchangeable, um, but that's the kind of analyzing I like to do. And if if you're not a big theory person, just kind of get the roots, just so you know that the pickup goes into um, a, a G on the first beat of the first full bar, and it's a C in the bass. Just making those little tiny analyzations can help get you on your way, even if you don't know a ton about harmony. So later on in the chart, right after the trumpet solo, there's this wonderful ensemble section. And if I'm playing this in a big band, I really want to know what the lead, whoever's playing the melody, what they're doing. And in this case, it's actually on third trumpet. Um, so that melody sounds like this. So in 
it's an octave up because when the trumpet is playing in that same range uh, relative to the trombone, which is around our tuning note, they're actually an octave above us, right? So the lead trombone part sits about a fifth or a sixth, sometimes lower than that, sometimes an octave lower. And this part has a little bit less shape than the melody, but you have to shape it as though you are playing the melody notes because to play it, the notes on the page, without thinking of the melody, it could sound like this. So it's pretty monotone, it's pretty flat. But I think of that melody and try to play with those shapes. All of a sudden it comes to life a little bit more and that will further support what the lead player is doing. Um, and just make the ensemble sound a little bit more cohesive. If I jump down to the third trombone part, you'll see how much less shape that has. But now we're really getting deep into the lower part of the voicing. So it's still important to try to keep that melody in mind and shape it the way that the lead player is. heard the phrase you're only strongest as your weakest link or you're only as strong as your weakest link and that's not to say that your third trombonist is going to be the weakest link in the band but sometimes our lead players have a little bit more confidence uh, they play a little bit louder which is not always good um, but the third trombone player can make a trombone section when you have the opportunity to play in a big band where the third trombone player has amazing technique and also listens um, and listens with their musical ear and really knows how to adapt what they're doing. That's when big bands really come to life um, and they just are absolutely amazing and exciting. So bottom line, listen, listen, listen. Because the more you do it and the more you focus on it, the better you get at it and the more layers you can hear and the more layers you're gonna add to your ensemble playing. Ask your directors for a PDF of, of the score of any of the charts you're working on. Learn the melodies, improvise a little bit around them if you can, and just have fun. Mm -hmm.